Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're covering chapter 16 of General Chemistry 2, and this chapter is all about chemical thermodynamics. Now, thermodynamics is the study of energy and its transformations. If you remember from Gen Chem 1, we looked at one of the topics within thermodynamics called thermochemistry, which is really concerned with the amount of heat released or absorbed during chemical and physical changes. In particular, we learned how to describe the enthalpy change for a process, and we saw that enthalpy helps us see how energy can be transferred during the course of a chemical reaction. Now, in this chapter, we are going to focus on two additional thermodynamic functions, entropy change, which we'll refer to as delta S, and free energy change that we'll refer to as delta G. Entropy is gonna help us understand why energy is, trans is transferred, and free energy will help us understand when it can be transferred. Now, as an introduction to this topic, I'm gonna just cut to the chase and show you an equation that's gonna be fundamental, uh, uh, fundamentally important for the rest of this discussion, and it is this Gibbs free energy formula. We see Gibbs, the free energy term right here, delta G, we see our enthalpy term right here, we see temperature, and then we see our entropy term here. Now, to start this conversation, we wanna ask, how do we know if a reaction will be spontaneous or not? How much energy is available to do work? And to really answer this question, we need to understand enthalpy and we're gonna have to understand entropy. We also need to remind ourselves what we mean when we, sp when we say spontaneous, right? When is a process spontaneous and what does spontaneous really mean? Now, when we use it in this context of chemical thermodynamics, spontaneous is used a little differently than it is in everyday uh, speech and thermodynamics, spontaneous does not um, imply that a reaction just begins on its own. Or it relates more to once a reaction has begun, it will continue reacting without having to be driven by some outside source of energy. All right. So when is a process spontaneous in thermodynamics? A process is considered spontaneous if it is able to proceed on its own without being driven by an outside source of energy. And another term you're, you're gonna commonly be, uh, be hearing in, in Gen Chem 2, in addition to spontaneous, is thermodynamically driven. Any chemical reaction proceeding towards equilibrium is considered thermodynamically driven or spontaneous. Now, how can we predict whether a reaction will be spontaneous? Well, it's going to be dependent on enthalpy and entropy. All right. Now, for enthalpy, we've covered this in Gen Chem 1, but let's let's remind ourselves. All right. Enthalpy change uh, for a reaction, we note this as delta H. Enthalpy is the sum of bond dissociation energies for a reaction. We can think of it um, as a heat of reaction. All right. Now, the... The um, enthalpy can be broken down into two categories that can describe a reaction, right? When you, when you are uh, looking at the sum of bond dissociation energies for a reaction, you can have negative value uh, of, that, of enthalpy or you can have a positive value where negative value relates to an exothermic reaction and positive values um, um, relate to an endo thermic reaction. Exothermic reaction means that it releases heat. Endothermic means that it absorbs heat during the reaction. Enthalpy is used to measure exchange of energy and bond dissociation energies describe the strength of chemical bonds. These can be determined experimentally and you'll see a lot of, of, of tables that will give you the bond dissociation energies or your standard enthalpy for, for specific um, bonds and molecules. Note that the total change in enthalpy for the reaction is referred to as the heat of reaction. And once again, you're gonna have negative values which relate to an exothermic reaction, one that releases heat. These are related to bond formation. Um, positive values are endothermic, and this is 
relates to bond breaking. All right, so that's a good review of enthalpy. If you need a more in-depth review of enthalpy, by all means, um, go and check out my uh, thermochemistry video in the Gen Chem 1 playlist. That should be a pretty good review of everything you need to know about enthalpy in your general chemistry courses. Now, that's one way. That, that's one variable that's important in determining if a reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. All right. Another thing that we might consider to determine whether a reaction will be spontaneous or not is the entropy of the system. And you can think of entropy, which we write as S, as a measure of the disorder or randomness of, of, of the system. Now, there's there's a better, better definitions for this, um, but we're going to get to our entropy here in a second um, in a little more, more detail. But entropy is another factor that is important to know in order to determine whether your reaction will be spontaneous or not. All right. Positive entropy, positive entropy values means your reaction is favored. All right. And your negative values means that it's unfavored. The entropy increased. Uh, when the entropy increases, we can say that the sign of delta S is positive. And if it decreases, then we usually say that the delta S is negative. All right. Now, to summarize, processes that are exothermic, right, in terms of enthalpy, um, they're going to have delta H values that are obviously going to be less than zero, right? Because we want negative values. That's that relates to an exothermic reaction. They often tend to be spontaneous. However, there are many exceptions. And processes in which the entropy of the system increases, that is, delta S is greater than zero, tend to be favored or often tend to be spontaneous. Again, there are many exceptions. Therefore, this allows us to say something that we cannot predict whether a reaction will be spontaneous or not simply by only looking at enthalpy alone or entropy alone. All right. Sometimes these two factors are in sense working against each other. All right. And so in order to determine whether the system is spontaneous or not, you have to look at both and you have to look at the values of both and their extents in relationship to each other. And so like I showed as just a preliminary motivation for this chapter, or I showed our Gibbs free energy formula, right? Later in this chapter, the thermodynamic functions of enthalpy and entropy, we're going to see how they're related to, to each other in this free energy equation. And this is what's going to be used to determine whether a process is spontaneous or not. Now, we have hopefully a good grasp on enthalpy since we covered this in general chemistry one, but my definition of entropy here in terms of, oh, it's a measure of disorder or randomness of a system and positive values mean increase and that's favored and negative values mean decrease and that's unfavored is very vague. So let us spend a few minutes to, to discuss entropy. Entropy is often described like we said, as disorder or randomness. The more disordered the system, the higher the entropy. Although this is the easier way to think about entropy, it really doesn't capture its full effects. More precisely, entropy is a thermodynamic function that's related to the number of microstates or arrangements available to a system. So um, we can we can define this by a formula that we write as S equals K natural log omega, where this is Boltzmann's constant, and omega is the number of microstates available to the system. All right. Now, it's a, a good motivation to think about entropy in the sense of things that we know, like temperature. Right. We know heat flows from hot to cold objects and not the other way around. And we know that gases like to mix rather than separate. And the motivation for both of these things is entropy. All right. Entropy is the state function that dis that predicts the direction of natural or spontaneous change. 
Now, in our definition of entropy here, where we have entropy equal to Boltzmann's constant times natural log of the microstates, we really want to dive into this. This is, this is Boltzmann's definition of entropy. And according to Boltzmann's equation, a system with fewer microstates is going to have a smaller value for W. And therefore, if it has a smaller value of W, it's going to have lower entropy. A system with more microstates has a larger value of W and therefore has higher entropy. All right. Now, um, to illustrate this idea of microstates, right, because that's a word that we're probably not all familiar with, we're going to imagine that four gases, all right, labeled A, B, C, and D, are free to move around in this in these two flask system. All right. At any moment in time, one of these molecules is either going to be found on the left or right. Okay. And what we can do is to really understand all the possibilities of how these four molecules can distribute themselves among this two beaker system. We can write what is possible that we can find on the left and what we can find on the right. And we can write a bunch of, of, of configurations of how they might distribute themselves. And those are all listed here. All right. Every possibility is shown here. All right, and we see 16 different microstates that are possible. You might look into your look at your two flask flask system and find that they're all in the left side and none on the right. Or you may look at this two flask system and see A and B on the left and C and D on the right. All right? Or any one of these possibilities. These are 16 microstates that describe what possibilities you might see to describe your system and the way your four gas molecules are distributed in this system, all right? So in essence, your microstate is, is a definition of what your system looks like and the number of possibilities of microstates has a play into your entropy value, all right? So that's really important to keep in mind in terms of a definition, all right? now. Entropy and, and the state, the particles, a, a couple of important points in, in addition to, to this definition of entropy that we, we've stated that we need to understand for entropy is that there are a couple of points that we need to keep in mind when we are trying to understand entropy. All right. First and foremost, all right, for a given substance, all right, for a given substance, well, well, first of all, let me say one more thing. A system, just to, to reiterate, right? A system with fewer microstates, all right? Say, for example, you have a system that has two microstates. You have a system like this where you have 16 microstates, all right? Your, your microstates, W is equal to 2 for one thing. W equals 16 for another thing. A system with fewer macro, microstates has a smaller value of W. And what does that mean? Just to refresh our mind, that means lower entropy. But then as the number of microstates available to the system increases, the entropy of the system also increases because now your W value is greater. All right, so back to the points that we also need to keep in mind. For a given substance, if the temperature increases, then entropy also increases and your delta S is greater than zero. In general, gases have a higher entropy than liquids. Liquids have a higher entropy than solids. All right. A solution usually has higher entropy than the separated sol solute and solvent. OK, although there are a few exceptions that we're not going to get into in general chemistry. All right. So with that being said, let us practice understanding entropy, all right, by determining the sign of entropy for the following processes. All right, let's do A. All right, we have process A where, we're ha where we are going from liquid water to vapor, water vapor. All right, water in the gas phase. Determine the sign 
of delta S for this. Now, we just stated a couple of really important facts. We said, in general, gases have a higher entropy than liquids, and then liquids have a higher entropy than solids. And then you can also say that gases obviously are also going to have higher entropy than solids. So we know a gas has higher entropy than, than a liquid. That means when water vaporizes, when water goes from liquid to gas, all right, entropy here is increasing. And that means your entropy value is going to be greater than zero. All right, entropy increases for this reaction. Fantastic. What about B? All right, what's happening here in B? We're going from four iron moles and three oxygen moles to two iron oxides all right fantastic there are three moles of gas on the reactant side all right which one is the gas this is gas this is solid all right and we have we have sorry three moles of gas on the reactant side none on the product side the entropy of gases is much higher than that of solids or, or liquids. So the reactant side has greater entropy. And so if this reaction is proceeding forward, then the entropy decreases in this reaction. All right, entropy is decreasing in this reaction, so delta S is less than zero. All right, let's look at C. We have N, one mole of N2 gas plus three moles of H2 gas, and that forms two ammonia gas molecules. All right, moles. There are four moles of gas total on the reactant side. There are two moles total of gas molecules on the product side. Since this reaction results in fewer moles of gas, all right, then once again, the entropy is decreasing and delta S is less than zero. Fantastic. Now we want to move on to the laws of thermodynamics. There's four. We're going to cover the first, second, and third law of thermodynamics. We're not going to worry all so much about the zeroth law, but I will read it to you if you're interested. The zeroth law says that two systems in equilibrium with a third system are in thermal equilibrium with each other. So if we have A, B, and C, we know that A and B are in thermal equilibrium. All right, we know, all right, these are in thermal equilibrium. We know B and C are in thermal equilibrium. The zeroth law allows us to make the conclusion that since A and B are in thermal equilibrium and B and C are also, then, the, then A and C by extension are also in thermal equilibrium. That's what the zeroth law tells us. It's, it's all about temperature, all right? Now, our focus here is going to be that first, second, and law in this chapter. And so if you remember... In general chemistry one, we actually encountered the first law of thermodynamics. And the first law of thermodynamics is also known as the conservation of energy law. And it says that energy can change forms, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. So energy of an isolated system is constant because it can change forms, but it can neither be created nor destroyed and but what we mean by an isolated system is one that cannot exchange energy or matter with its surroundings all right so in essence the first law is really just saying that energy is conserved and the total energy of the universe is constant all right it's neither created nor destroyed it's constant but energy can change forms all right so that's important now also we're going to concern ourselves here with the second law of thermodynamics all right. The second law of thermodynamics states that in any spontaneous process, the total entropy of the universe increases. All right. We can say this in, in a number of ways. All right. We can say what we just said, that the total entropy of the system and surroundings always increase during the spontaneous process. All right. We can also say that delta S total, which is, by the way, equal to delta S system plus delta S surroundings. We've seen this. We've seen this in um, Gen Chem 1, all right? This delta S total is going to be greater than zero for spontaneous processes, all right? So that's another way to write this. 
Now, it's important to emphasize that the second law does not say that the entropy of the system increases in any spontaneous process. It does not say that the process where the entropy of the system decreases cannot be spontaneous. Remember, spontaneity is based off of two things, entropy and enthalpy. All right. So you cannot just have entropy information and right away say a, sp a process is spontaneous. All right. But in general, all right, all right, in, in a spontaneous process, the total entropy of the universe increases. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna see this in play um, later on, and we're gonna realize that that making a a complete statement about spontaneity is dependent on knowing both the enthalpy and the entropy. All right, fantastic. Now the third law of thermodynamics states that the absolute entropy of a pure, perfectly ordered crystalline substance at at, at zero Kelvin, its absolute entropy is zero. All right, and the significance of this law is that all entropy values can be measured relative to the absolute zero of entropy at zero Kelvin. And that means the absolute entropy of a system can be known at any given temperatures because of this law. All right, so it's going to have important consequences here as we transition into entropy calculations. All right. Now, the standard entropy change for a reaction, which is delta S reaction standard, is the entropy change when all reactants and products are in their thermodynamic standard states. All right. This means that every gas exerts a partial pressure of exactly one atmosphere. Every solid and liquid is in its pure form at exactly one atmosphere pressure. Every solute in a solution has a concentration of exactly one mole. And the temperature is at 298 Kelvin unless otherwise specified. All right, that's what we mean when we're talking about the standard entropy change for a reaction um, <laughs> um, here. All right, so this delta S reaction actually can be determined using this relationship, which we have written here. All right. We have the sum of, of the entropy of the products minus the sum of all the re entropy of the reactants. All right, here S naught, if we will, all right, represents the absolute entropy of a substance under standard state conditions. All right, and these NP and R factors here are represent the stoichiometric coefficients of the products and reactants from the balanced equation. All right, we're going to see this really at play when we do the following example. But before we jump into the pro that problem, one more thing that's important for us, and that's determining the entropy of the surroundings. Now, the second law of thermodynamics tells us to focus our attention to the change in entropy of the universe, which consists of two components, system and surroundings, the entropy of the system and the entropy of the surroundings. All right, remember, delta S total is delta S system plus delta S surroundings. All right, now, we can determine the delta S system, uh, we can determine the change in entropy of the system for any physical or chemical change. We've seen this before, but how do we determine the change in entropy of our surroundings? All right, and the answer is yes, there's a formula that we can use, and this formula is shown right here. Delta S surroundings is equal to minus delta H of the system, so minus the change in enthalpy of the system over temperature. All right, we're not going to derive this. This is something that's derived if you're going to take physical chemistry later on. But for general chemistry, we are not going to worry about the derivation or proof. We are simply going to make a statement about the formula. All right. Now, the sign of delta S surrounding is going to determine on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic, obviously. And so in summary here, we've seen we can determine the change in entropy of the system. And now we can do the change in entropy of the surrounding. And th this is going to be useful. All right. Uh, to solve problems that we're going to do right now, and also to motivate and develop a new thermodynamic function, our Gibbs free energy formula, which we'll see shortly. All right, so let's do this practice problem. 
This practice problem says, consider the following reaction carried out under constant pressure conditions. All right, first we want to what we want to answer is what is the value of delta S surroundings at 298 Kelvin? All right, and also, ultimately, we also want to see if the reaction is spontaneous. So let's answer that first part. All right, let's answer if delta S surroundings, what is delta S surroundings? Let's write our formula. We know this is delta is equal to minus delta H of the system over temperature. We are given the enthalpy here, all right, and we're given the temperature as well, so it's kind of just plug and chug. All right, this is minus 66.4 kilojoules over 298 Kelvin. This is going to give us, if we plug it into a calculator, minus 0 0.223 kilojoules per Kelvin. All right, we can also write this in joules just by expanding it. It's minus 233 joules per Kelvin. This is the entropy for the surroundings. Now, we want to answer, is this reaction spontaneous? Well, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that a process can only be spontaneous if the results in an if the if it results in an increase in the total entropy of the universe. We saw in part A that the entropy of the surroundings decreases during this process, right? Because we got a negative delta S surroundings. We can determine the sign of the change in the entropy of the system by looking at this balanced equation. We start with three moles of gas and we end up with only two moles of gas all right so there's also a decrease in the number of moles in the chemical reaction so there's a the entropy of the system is also going to decrease and that means it's going to be negative so if we have both a negative entropy of the systems and negative entropy of the surroundings that means the delta s universe or total is also going to be negative all right, and that means the reaction is not spontaneous with the, with the information we have so far. All right, fantastic. We're going to stop here for, for, for the first part of this chapter. In the next part of the chapter, we're going to... Actually, wait, there's one more question. Let's do one more question before we stop, and then next time we'll talk about Gibbs free energy. My apologies. Let's do this problem. Use the table of selected thermodynamic data. So usually your textbook will have this in the back of the chapter. Um... I have these values for you that I'm just going to give you, but you can always double check these values by looking in the literature or in the back of your textbook to determine the value of delta S reaction at 298 for this reaction. All right, so we're going to use our formula for the delta S reaction, right, that we just saw. It's equal to the sum of all the moles and entropies of the product minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants. And here what we see in our equation, delta S reaction, all right, product we have MgO and CO2, and for product, uh, for reactants we have MgCO3. So, and they're all, it's balanced and it's all just one. All right, the, the X, the, the coefficients here are just one for all of them. All right, so what we're doing is we're going to find, we're going to multiply one times the entropy of the product, MgO, plus one times the entropy of CO2, all right, minus that of the reactants, which is just one times the entropy of MgCO3. And these values you will find in an appendix in the back of your book. Or, your, or, or you could just look up literature values. This is 26.9 plus this is 213.7 minus the final one, which is just um, 65.6. And if we add and subtract all these together, what we get for delta S of reaction is 175 joules per Kelvin. All right, and that's how you solve the problem. Fantastic. Okay, now this is officially the end of this part. Next time, we'll start our discussion on Gibbs free energy. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful day.